And I try to pay attention to what's going on around me. And this morning when I got in the car, the song that came on the radio, modern day poets, Calvin Harris and Neo, if you will, it's not, a, it's not what you've done, it's about what you're doing. It's, a, it's all about where you're going, not where you've been. So where are you? Where are you? I hope that you are more real today than you've ever been in your life before. How many people have read The Velveteen Rabbit? Yes, right? One of my most favorite stories. If you're real, you've been loved. And you know what that means. Are you feeling real today? Are you in your authenticity today? I love that. How many baby boomers do we have in the room? Yeah. Boomers. That's right. How many Gen Xers? That would be me as evidenced by the fact that I still cling to the paper. I love the trees and I love the paper. You won't see me with an iPad up here. How many uh, Gen Z? Let's see. Yeah, Gen Z's. How many millennials? A few. Well, I'm going to particularly love on the Gen Z's, so unfortunately they're not represented in the space, but hopefully in cyberspace. I'll tell you all a funny story about something that happened to me not too long ago with a Gen Z, and that is, you know, sometimes Gen Xers are a little challenged with the technology. That would be me. And I'm in one of those checkout lines, right, where They've scanned my groceries, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on on the screen in front of me so that I can pay. And this young Gen Z expression of love was a little impatient with my Gen X self. And, uh, And I'm, you know, trying to figure out on the screen where I'm at and scan my car, do this, that, and the other. And she says, waiting on you. I got that. Let me just, and then I realized that's exactly what life is saying to me all the time. Waiting on you. Waiting on you. There's nothing out there that's opposing us, and yet nothing but potential impossibility and benevolence awaiting within. And that's where we're real. That's where we are our most authentic is within. Waiting on you. Certain concepts seem to be assigned to certain people at very specific times in history. Have you noticed that? Think about Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Think about Harriet Tubman. Think about Maya Angelou. Their whole life was about their mission. And their mission was heart-centric. Think about how powerful the contributions of these individuals. How powerful. We still talk about these people. We still think about these people. We're still, we are still inspired by these people because they are still inspiring simply because their whole existence was in alignment with universal truth. And we're going to talk about that today. The difference between power and force at a time in our existence where it is paramount for us to know the difference and my family be the difference. So before we dive off into that sea, I want to start with the words of Ernest Holmes. And as some of you Gen Xers may know, some font is easier than other font. The words of Ernest Holmes. I surrender all fear, all doubt. I let go of all uncertainty. I know there is no confusion, no lack of confidence. I know what is mine will claim me. It will know me. It will rush to me. I accept the gift of life for myself and for everyone else. 
I accept the gift of life for myself and for everyone else. This thing called you, Ernest Holmes. Now, you'll also notice the words behind me. Please take responsibility for the energy you bring into this space. Can you imagine just for a second if that sign were on the door to every establishment that you ever entered? First of all, how many people do you think would understand what in the hell it meant? (laughs) Would you understand? Raise your hand if you think you would understand. Okay. All right. So... This, this comes from what I think is a miraculous story. And very briefly, I'm going to give you the background on how this found me. A neuroanalyst in Boston at Harvard, picture it. Jill Bolte Taylor is her name. And something incredible happened to this neuroanalyst while she was in practice at Harvard. And that is one morning she awoke and she had a tremendous pain in the left side of her brain behind her eye. And what was happening is she was having a massive stroke. And she was literally able to sort of experience herself having the stroke. And because she's a neuroanalyst, she was able to sort of observe this happening um, despite the fact that she shouldn't have had wherewithal. So what ended up happening was the left side of her brain, the side that is occupied with linear aspects of life, facts, and data, and we have a process. We've always done it this way. This is what we, it's called precedent. That would be the left hemisphere of the brain. That side of her brain was rendered completely inactive by this stroke. And during the time that she was in recovery, the right side of her brain, which is the side that knows our true nature, that realizes our connection to all that is, she experienced herself as massive because it was only the right side of her brain that was active. So as she was in recovery, she remembers actually having the thought to herself, how in the world am I ever going to fit back in that tiny little body again? I'm so enormous. My capacity is unlimited. But something else was also true, and that is that because the left side of her brain was rendered inoperable, or not inoperable, but not in operation, and the right side of her brain was overactive, every mood of every person that came in the room to treat her during her process was hyper-enhanced for her. Everything she felt so intensely, if they were in a bad mood, if they were having a bad day, if they were happy, everything. And so, this sign was placed on the door to her hospital room. Please take responsibility for the energy you bring into the space because I am incredibly sensitive. So, one reason that I absolutely love this is because I think it reminds me every day of the opportunity that we have, and I have, to take responsibility for whether or not I'm real, whether or not I'm authentic, whether or not I'm living from the truth of who I am, or whether I'm still in my individuality trying to manipulate, and what else do we do? Manipulate, All the, all the small-minded things, all the things that are the, the reflection of our fear of not being connected to something larger and greater. So taking responsibility is, ooh, that's a theme that has been at the forefront of my life this year. And I'll remind you, in case you don't know, that all of us are running around with an inner critic an inner adolescent, an inner child, and hopefully to God, an inner balanced, healthy adult. Well, I'll tell you, my inner adolescent's name is Melissa, and she is not about accountability. She is not about responsibility, especially to herself, which is really interesting, the things that we do. 
when we become ego aligned, when we shift from the place of power to a place of force in our life. Melissa is a very forceful one. But fortunately, there is my balanced healthy adult. And my balanced healthy adult found a book not too long ago called Power Versus Force by Stephen R. Hawking. Anybody read it? It's fascinating reading. It's fascinating. So in this book, Dr. Hawkins clearly uh, describes the difference according to universal truth and his work between power and force. So when we're talking about power, we're talking about innate and effortless. Okay, we're talking about a force that emanates from truth, integrity, and inner alignment with the greater good. Power is inherently strong. It's stable. It's sustainable because it aligns with universal principles of truth. Remember I mentioned before those powerful figures from history. Their life mission, their purpose, their work aligned with universal spiritual truth. That's why it's inspiring today. It always will be. It's powerful. Power is also aligned with positive influence. Power operates silently, does not need to be asserted aggressively. It attracts. It inspires. It leads to constructive and life-affirming outcomes. Finally, power is self-sustaining. It does not diminish or exhaust over time. Instead, it grows and multiplies like compounded interest in a bank account. It creates a positive impact on individuals and society. Think about the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It continues to make a positive effect on society, generation after generation. Now, let's talk about force. Force is aligned with exertion and manipulation. It's described as something that requires effort, control, and often coercion. It's rooted in fear, domination, and the need to assert control over others. Now, if we're being really, really honest, every person in this room has had the experience where they felt the need to assert control over another person. However, we have an option. Force also tends to lead to conflict, resistance, and opposition. Force is unsustainable because it's based on imposition rather than cooperation or understanding. Imposition rather than cooperation or understanding. And force is temporary and depleting. Unlike power, force is temporary. It requires constant energy to maintain, and its effects often lead to negative consequences or backlash. Finally, Hawkins argues that power is far more effective and sustainable in the long run, while force, though it may achieve short-term goals ultimately weakens those who rely on it. And I will submit to you that force is very much in alignment with our ego self, whereas power is the opportunity of the heart. Through constructive thought and focus, we are at choice. Remember last time I was here, I said, you may not realize this, but you're creative. You may not be a singer like Miss Jackie Wilson. You may not be a painter or an actor or a writer. You don't have to be. You're creative by nature. We are creative on the level of our thinking. And what's so important to understand is that it's impossible to think in neutral thought. So in every given moment, A Course in Miracles would teach us, we are either creating love or fear. And it's our choice. So there's one thing I've noticed about people who have done a lot of work 
to love themselves, which, by the way, I think is the most important work we'll ever do. Loving ourselves is worth whatever it takes. But there's something very important that I've noticed in people who do the work to learn to love themselves more, and that is they take their dreams very seriously. Because they don't see their dreams as foolish notions. They see their dreams as blueprints to the contributions that only they might make to the healing of the lovelessness on planet Earth. Right? Their dreams are much more than simple notions. They're literally guideposts to where love would have us go. Our dreams are guideposts to what love would have us say and to whom and how we might say it. We might whistle love. Right, Miss Jackie Wilson? There's a lot of ways to be loving in the world. Power is our opportunity when we take responsibility. Now, <laughs> you might say, okay, how do I be powerful? This is all new to me. I haven't read that book. Never seen you before. Not really sure what you're wearing. Um, what? <clears throat> how can I be powerful? Well, one thing that I've learned about power is that power relies on receptivity. Power relies on our willingness, take a breath, to yield have you ever ridden in a car with someone who was uh, unwilling to yield? <laughs> I learned how important it is, that option to yield, when I was learning to drive and my mother was in the jump seat. And I remember one day, you know, I was about 15, I had my learner's permit, and uh, you know, of course, she said, I told your daddy I was not going to do this, that he was going to teach you to drive, I do not have the nerves for this. And yet here I am, just like always. So I'm driving along, and I missed a yield. And as the result, I kind of had to veer into the median. And all I remember my mother saying from the passenger seat was, Oh, Lord, be with me! <laughs> Y'all, my mother's from Bristol, so Appalachian roots run deep. Not be with us. <laughs> be with me! And I learned that day how important it is to yield. And as I've grown, and as I've become a critical thinker, life continues to offer me the opportunity to consider again and again and again the beautiful gift that resides in a willingness to yield. What becomes possible when we can simply become available? When we become available to a higher thought, a softer thought, a better thought, a healing thought, an inclusive thought, what becomes possible? Power becomes possible. Timelessness becomes possible. The kind of contribution that helps to heal the world becomes possible simply in our willingness to yield. To yield to that left brain, that monkey mind, that yak, 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 that constant chatter. A Course in Miracles teaches us that every problem comes bearing its own solution. But there's a catch. Einstein taught us that problems and solutions do not exist on the same level of consciousness. Somebody's, somebody's getting something over here. Problems and solutions do not exist on the same level of consciousness. So what happens when we're focused on the problem? What happens when we're focused on their behavior? What happens when we're focused on the circumstances that are just about to take me to the mat? As you can tell, I've never been there. I don't know what that means. 
what happens is we continue to recreate the problem. We continue on the level of the problem, therefore we we might as well just be participating in the problem, with the problem. We literally merge into the problem with our creative ability and just continue to create more of it. But we have an option. We take responsibility for what we're thinking. And we allow our consciousness to rise. And guess what? Solutions become available. When we shift our focus from the problems, from the annoyance, from the circumstances, we become available for the solutions, the love solutions. Now, how many people in this room have the ability to allow your vibration to raise at will? Mm hmm I've been doing some work. I love that. Yeah, that's really important to be able to do. That's taking responsibility for the energy you bring. Knowing that your energy, your frequency, your focus, that's on you, boo. But it's such a great opportunity. Because when you realize that it's on you, and you realize the things that you can do, stillness, meditation, hell, take a nap. It works. Try it. When you realize what you can do, you realize how you can be. The opportunity becomes real. So are you familiar with this concept of matching energy? So, you know, I, I like to stay somewhat current. And you get on the TikTok and the Instagram, and there's so many uh, people that have so many thoughts, and hey... I'm for it. Put it out there. Whatever you've got to say, somebody probably needs to hear it. And one of the themes that I continually hear on those platforms is, <clears throat> baby, I match energy. You come at me with some, you're going to get some. And I think, man, that's a really great opportunity. That's a really great opportunity for rooms like this to consider throw your good away because somebody else hasn't figured out how to create their own. Don't match their energy. Don't be a thermometer. Be a thermostat. Set the temperature. Set the tone. Matching energy is for the forceful. Being the energy of your choice is for the powerful. So Vic, what does all this mean? You've told us a lot of things, many of which I will not remember. That's the way this works, right? That's why we have to take it a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time. Many would suggest we're living at a time where we've gone as far as force can take us. If you think back and you look at our history, a lot of the most important things that have happened in our world have happened by force. Not calling them good, not calling them bad, calling them the result of force. We typically result to force when we feel like we have no other option, when we feel like we're alone, disconnected, when our left brain takes over. It's only through power that we might continue to ascend. It's through our willingness to yield, to be receptive to a higher thought, to a softer thought, to a healing thought that might lead us to collaborate, negotiate, liberate. And not merely tolerate, but family, appreciate. Are we ready to appreciate in this space? Are we really ready to look at difference from us and recognize that it's priceless? Are we really ready? 
We see what life looks like when the goal is survival. We resort to force. We resort to manipulation. We resort to coercion. We resort to all things that are not sustainable, that are not inclusive. And yet, we have the opportunity through accessing power by means of aligning our thought. We have the opportunity to experience what life can be like when our goal is thriving, not merely surviving, thriving. Powerfully, powerfully thriving. Taking responsibility for the energy you bring into this space. Taking responsibility for the energy you bring into your mind. Is your mind a safe place? How safe are you with you? If you remember anything I said today, remember to ask yourself, how safe am I with me? It's really difficult to create safety in the world when you can't create it inside. I love to leave you with a quote, and this one is one of my favorites. It's true, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Let's align with love and go kick ass. Welcome to the Sunday service at CSLN. We are a welcoming and inclusive community of inspired individuals caring for and about each other and the entire planetary family. The Center for Spiritual Living Nashville offers spiritual tools for anyone seeking a more fulfilled and meaningful life through a deeper connection with a higher power or universal truths. Be sure to subscribe below if you enjoy our programs.